Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me start off by a big thanks to Fernando for the invitation. Um, it's really something great he's got going here. I'm very happy to be a part of it this week. So, um, slight change of uh, title, but the topic is sort of uh, uh, very highly correlated. So it's a, a sort of long-term project, uh, or at least most of what I'll be talking about uh, is a long-term project with Mar Simon, and uh, um, the actual result I'll talk about is with, uh, with Andrew, uh, Andrew McLeod, now at UCL. Before I actually tell you what I want to talk about, um, let me start with, with an example. So what I want you to imagine is just nothing uh, more complicated than the standard flat, let's say, unit area uh, torus and the example says that there exists um, a sequence of Ricci flows let's call them DIT on T2 and Ricci flows on T2 are nice live for all time <coughs> And the initial data is converging to this nice flat torus. Okay. So of course the flat unit area torus will have a Ricci flow that's just the flat unit area torus, a stationary point. There's no curvature. So um, what I want to do is imagine that the initial data here converge to that flat unit area torus. So let's do it metrically. So let's take the Riemannian distance that's uh, induced by the initial metric. Okay, so just a function from T2 cross T2 to the reals. So this actually converges to the uh, Riemannian distance of the uh, standard flat torus. So this is nice uniform uh, conversions. So if these flows are nice enough, then you'd hope that the, uh, the flows will actually converge to this um, just static flat unit area torus. Now are the flows nice? So the flows are nice in the sense that they, they enjoy the uh, optimal scale invariant curvature estimate. So if you look at the Gauss curvature, here, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, no. I want that as I guess. We'll do. Thank you. So if you look at the Gauss curvature of the GIT, then this decays in the scale invariant way, which is a C on T. And what that says then is the parabolic regularity theory kicks in. So all the derivatives of everything inside are controlled. They decay like T to some negative power. So in particular, you can extract a subsequence, well, let's just take this sequence. Um, in general, a subsequence would converge smoothly. So let's say GIT converges to uh, G of T smoothly locally uh, on T2 cross time. So I've only got this estimate for positive time. So of course the equation passes to the limit, and this is a Ricci flow. I'm sorry, I'm assuming everyone knows what a Ricci flow is. Um, I think that's probably a fair, fair assumption looking around the room. <coughs> so uh, these flows do converge. So they should um, converge to the Ricci flow of uh, G0, but they don't. So they converge to a static Ricci flow, but two times G0. So the point is that you can have 
convergence of your initial data in the sense that actually crops up in applications. So metric conversions. And yet you have a complete loss of initial condition in the limit Ricci flow. Right? So this is something that uh, one should keep in mind uh, throughout the talk. So it's not um, terribly surprising if you're if you realize that what you, you have to assume traditionally in sort of uh, Tiga coding theory is some reachy lower bound. I'll come back to that in, in a second. Um, but let me uh, indicate why, um, why this is a problem. So as in the title, we want to consider Ricci flows starting with rough initial data. I'll elaborate on what that means. Um, but of course, the strategy, the tried and tested strategy to flow uh, rough data rough initial data would be uh, simply to approximate. So take your initial data, whatever it is, approximate it by a smooth initial data, then flow each approximation, and then pass prove estimates, and then pass to a limit. So of course, you can see from this example so that's actually a, a bit of a fraught thing to do, even if the initial data isn't rough. So even if you take the smoothest, nicest manifold that you can imagine, then this strategy will, um, would, will fail. So um, what's the fix in general? I alluded to this a second ago. The fix would be uh, make sure you're assuming something, and that something So let's say the fix would be to establish or assume a uniform lower Ricci bounds. So as an example, so this is known to work some situations, certainly not in all situations. So as an example, if you go to the, uh, the, the thesis of Thomas Richard, I was a student of uh, Jarre, and that I think was around uh, 2013, plus or minus, maybe 2012. <coughs> then um, a consequence of that is that if if you had a lower Ricci bound, in this case that would be a, a lower uh, Gauss curvature bound. that's uh, independent of i, then the limit Ricci flow that you would get in this, in this, under these conditions would not be anything other than the one you'd expect. So this theory now, now extends a lot to uh, the non-compact case, for instance. That theory has been developed over the last, over recent years. So in particular, in these examples, the, the Gauss curvature of the initial data has to converge to uh, minus infinity. <coughs> OK, so um, may maybe uh, l let me just uh, say a few words. I think maybe I don't want to get sidetracked writing all this down. But you know, why, why does, how does this proceed from a, a lower Ricci or lo lower Gauss curvature bound? Um, typically, what you're doing is then combining it with some other basic sort of zeroth order information that you have. And managing using some of Paramount's work. I think this was, in some sense, you know, the flavor of this is in Paramount's work, and Miles Simon is sort of the pioneer in this direction. Um, if you take such a lower bound, then you can actually combine it with some other weak information to get full C on T curvature DK of the, uh, of the curvature, which, in fact, in this case, already exists. And then the combination of that sort of curvature estimate of this form and this sort of lower bound will then tell, will then give you extremely good quantitative control on how the distance, um, the distance metric of the, of the Ricci flow actually behaves. You know, you can compare it at different times in a way that will pass nicely to the limit. So nothing bad like this will happen. Anyway, the moral to take away from this is to, uh, uh, is that we want some sort of Ricci lower bound. 
Okay, so um, let's go back to the sort of general question of uh, flowing uh, flowing rough data. So what does it actually what does it actually mean, or what is the sort of rough data that we want want to consider? So I mean, one can take Riemannian metrics that aren't smooth. That's not the most natural thing to do, in my opinion. The most natural thing to do is to consider metric spaces with some geometric structure. So let's say we want to flow a metric space xd. What does it actually, not, not how do we do it, but what does it actually mean? So we're then um, looking for a Ricci flow, let's say MGT, which lives not down to t equals zero. So I've got an open uh, interval here. Doesn't matter what the right hand side is. <coughs> so this is going to be the Ricci flow starting at that. So what does that mean? So it means that there exists some distance metric. So just a metric as in metric space on M, um, let's, let's call it D sub zero, such that if you look at the uh, Riemannian distance of this flow, then it should converge to this D0. Uniformly as T descends to zero. So, sorry, that's where the typo earlier came from. Okay, so uh, obviously not complete yet. What's XD got to do with anything? Well, of course, we want then that XD is isometric. to m d0. Or oh, the other thing that you want here is that this distance metric induces the same topology here as, as the actual manifold. Okay. <coughs> so if you're actually trying to solve this problem, the existence problem for Ricci flow, then it's kind of an interesting feature that what you're really asking the Ricci flow to do is not just find a one parameter family of metrics, but you're also asking it to generate a manifold. Okay, so this M is not given in the, in the problem. So that changes a little bit the flavor and you've got to stop and think about where that M is going to come from. At some point, you have to create a manifold and there aren't that many ways of doing that out of nothing. That maybe will sort of indicate why we're doing certain things as we go forwards. <coughs> Oh, yeah. Um, so it has these examples of the metrics from your example to the areas converge? Uh, they can't, no, because this, I mean, the initial data has unit area, and this one here has, uh, has a large area. Right. But if you do the areas converge, would that tell you anything? Yes. So um, if you have convergence of area in two-dimensional Ricci flows, it's a very general uniqueness result that I proved maybe 2015 that um, sort of convergence of area to Ricci flows with sort of sort of the measure area in a sort of same way as time goes down to zero will actually be the same one. And that works even in the non-compact case. So before, uh, yeah, you would use some other techniques in the compact case actually. <laughs> All right. So, um, metric space is a very general thing. Clearly, we have no hope of solving this existence problem for a general metric space. So, what sort of metric spaces are we actually going to look at? So, what we want to do is consider a special case for XD, a so called Ricci limit space. So normally I'll just write RLS. So these, what are these spaces? So these spaces are spaces that were studied heavily in some great work of Chi recording in the, in the, I guess the 90s. 
<coughs> and they're basically metric spaces that can be approximated by some a man a smooth manifold with some structure. So we want them to be approximated in general um, by a smooth manifold with a, a lower Ricci bound. So let's say approximated by smooth manifolds with um, some sort of uniform lower Ricci bound. And in everything that I talk about today, we're going to take the so-called non-collapse case. So um, I won't keep saying non-collapse, but you'll just have to keep thinking it. So what does non-collapse mean? Um, it means that the volume of, uh, let's say you take an ith approximation, then the volume, um, let's say the smooth manifolds are m i g i, maybe n-dimensional, then all these Ricci bounds are for g i, and then the volume of a ball uh, centered at some given point x i, not at any point x i, of uh, arbitrary radius, let's say one, is also uniformly controlled. Uniformly controlled, independent of i is the point. Okay, so what does it mean approximate? Um, it means, I need to tell you the sort of topology, so it means that if you take uh, the triple M, N, I, G, I, X, I, then this converges in the uh, so-called pointed gromov hausdorff sense to X, D, comma, some point P in, in X. So I just, if you're not really familiar with this sort of thing, it just means if you sort of stand at X, I and look around just metrically, nothing to do with curvature or anything, uh, just metrically, it's very much like standing at P and looking around. And, uh, you know, an example maybe will tell you everything you need to know initially. Sort of the easiest imaginable example would be a two-dimensional cone. So if you take such a thing, this is a metric space, not a smooth manifold, and uh, I'm including this point here, and it can be approximated by just smoothing it out, obviously. And when you smooth it out, you're not introducing more and more negative curvature, as long as the cone angle, of course, is less than 2 pi. If it were not, then that would not be possible. You'd be introducing more and more negative curvature that would violate this. Okay, so, um, right. So what do we want to do with these Ricci limit spaces? So we want to return to a question that comes up in the work of Cheeger and Colding. If you read just the introductions of their main paper, um, you'll find this, and it's also discussed in their work with Tian and in the work of Anderson. And let me phrase it very roughly to begin with. The question you could say is basically, it's about the regularity of these spaces. So obviously they're not smooth manifolds. We've already seen an example there. So you could phrase it as, is a large subset of a, a Ricci limit space, a large open subset, homeomorphic to a, a topological manifold. So that's pretty, uh, pretty vague for the moment, but um, let's just sort of uh, see where that takes us. So if you look at this example here, it's, it's got a singularity by any reasonable definition of singularity at the tip here, but it's completely topologically regular in the sense that it's homeomorphic to R2. Uh, so that's very straightforward. Okay, so um, more generally, in any dimension, if you've got a metric space that can be approximated by a sequence of manifolds with a stronger condition that the sectional curvature is bent below, which actually it is in 2D because Ricci and sectional are the same, I mean a lower bound, um, well, 
Yeah, a lower bound is, uh, no, they're the same in 2D. So in any dimension, if you can approximate with a lower sectional bound, much stronger, so much more restricted metric space, then Perelman's stability from the 90s uh, will actually tell you that the whole thing is uh, homeomorphic to a, a topological manifold. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that's the sort of more, more general statement. So you might think, well, hang on, maybe all Ricci limit spaces, if, if all of those special uh, so-called Alexandra spaces are topological to ma uh, manifold, uh, homeomorphic to manifold, then maybe uh, all Ricci limit spaces are. So let me give you one well-known example which isn't. So if you just take the uh, if you just take the metric cone over RP three, so I want you to think of that as just taking R4 and quotienting uh, every point with its antipodal point, including the origin, keeping the origin, obviously. So this now is a Ricci limit space. So it's, an, it's a simple metric cone with a singularity at the origin, but you can just excise a little neighborhood of the origin and paste in a four-dimensional manifold, which is pretty much Ricci flat. Um, certainly has Ricci lower bounds. So just use the Iguchi Hansen metric if you know uh, what that is. Um, and there's no problem with the, the non-collapsedness. So this is a, uh, a Ricci limit space in four dimensions. Um, and it's not, uh, this singularity, it's a cone over RP3, a cone over anything other than the sphere is not a, uh, is not homeomorphic to a manifold. So there's certainly a regularity theory that needs to be uh, needs to be established. Um, let's sort of imagine a slightly more general conjecture. So you could take this example and trivially cross it with uh, a Euclidean factor. Let's say R n minus four. So it's all n dimensional. Obviously, that's just cross all the approximations with R n minus four. It's obviously a Ricci limit space, and then you've got a sort of an R n minus four singular space, so that's all very trivial. Um, so heuristically, then, uh, so this is not going to be a true statement by any stretch of the imagination, so off a set of dimension less than n minus 4, reach your limit space, well let's be vague, sort of intuitively it should be a manifold off a set of that size. Let's imagine, uh, I don't want to get uh, bogged down with uh, too, too much technical detail in the high dimensional case, but uh, to actually state the conjecture that I guess originally appeared in uh, Chiga Colding, um, the way you would do it is you take the whole Ricci limit space and then you would subtract the appropriate stratum of the singular set. So just as in Nation's talk uh, the other day, then the singular set, which I've not really defined, but you can sort of imagine it sort of points like this, stratifies depending on whether, when you look very closely, what sort of dimension. It's all a little bit vague. What sort of Euclidean factor you, you split off. So if you if you subtract the right stratum of the singular set, which is known to be of dimension less than n minus 4, due to Chiga coding, then you have to take the interior of that, and then that should be a topological manifold, says the conjecture. So, um, which is a little bit, um, th there's something a little bit unsatisfying with that statement as, as I've stated it, because what you've done is you subtract a, a set which you don't really know much about and then take an interior. So if that set is actually quite bad structure, then you're not really saying anything. Um, but let, let's not get hung up on that at the moment because what we want to look at today is just the three-dimensional case. So that is easy to state the, the conjecture. So in um, in 3D, then the conjecture of, of uh, so it's, <coughs> the 
this is normally attributed to Anderson. Well, the, the, the one that I said in words, the more general one, uh, attributed to Anderson, Chiga, Kolding, and Tian. But in this restricted, um, uh, so I want to say this, their conjecture in 3D would be saying that a three-dimensional Ricci limit space, so what I mean by that is you've approximated by three-dimensional manifolds, so n, n was three here, and because you have this non-collapsing, the, the Ricci limit space sort of inherits a sort of dim a dimension. So a three-dimensional di Ricci limit space should be uh, everywhere homeomorphic now, because n minus four is now less than zero, should, should be homeomorphic to a topological map. So that's what they would have said. So let me give you the, the theorem then. Okay, so um, the theorem is stronger than the conjecture. So this, um, as I say, most of this, the, this project is joined with Miles Simon. The actual statement that I'll make is from the, uh, the work with Andrew McLeod. Um, but, you know, the heavy lifting to a large extent, or a lot of the heavy lifting is in the work with Miles Simon, and we heavily use some ideas of uh, Raphael Hoshar, who's a postdoc at Warwick at the moment. So, um, what does this theorem say? It says that any three dimensional Ricci limit space is globally homeomorphic to a smooth manifold and the homeomorphism is not just a homeomorphism, it's much stronger so it satisfies an extra regularity condition which is quite common in this game in various contexts it's locally by Hilda. So the, yeah, so the homeomorphism in its inverse is is Hilda. But uh, maybe that requires a little bit, a little bit of uh, elaboration. So when I say locally by Hilda, you know, you take restrict a compact region, and you've got by Hilda, but the even the Hilda exponent depends on the the compact region. <clears throat> okay, so uh, yeah, so I want to tell you a little bit about how to prove that. Let me first say that the same sort of ideas uh, will carry through in high dimensions if you impose a sufficiently stronger extra curvature condition than a, a, a Ricci lower bound when you define your metric spaces. So um, I don't want to get into those conditions, but it, it will involve the notion of positive isotropic curvature of Mikhailov and more. So uh, that was carried out by Yi Lai, and they use, and she uses, some higher dimensional curvature estimates that are due to Bamla, Cabethas Rivas, and Wilking. Okay. So how are we actually going to try and prove this result, which has nothing to do with Ricci flow, um, using Ricci flow? So the strategy is as follows. And I think probably the earliest work using this sort of strategy for this sort of result 
is the work of Miles Simon from, uh, I guess he, he was doing this over 10 years ago, uh, this sort, sort of style of thing. And the strategy is as follows. So try to flow, in other words, Ricci flow, the Ricci limit space, let's call it xd. So that gives then a Ricci flow <coughs> Let's call it MGT, just as we had earlier on. And of course, just as in the definition that probably on probably now raised, as time goes back to zero, then the uh, Ricci flow will converge metrically to uh, so the Riemannian distance will converge to d zero, which is then isometric to that space. Okay, so let's try and flow it get this Ricci flow here. So what we need to show is something about the, uh, the metric space m comma d0. So if you can do that, then maybe you can also try to show, so this is something that only comes from our um, recent work with, with Mar Simon. Try to show that if you look at the identity map, phrase it like this, from, from the uh, Ricci limit space to the Ricci flow, and think of t as being really small, then this should be uh, locally by hole. So what you're trying to do is prove good estimates, good curvature estimates on your Ricci flow, so the distance can't change too much. Okay. So it can't increase too much, it can't decrease too much. So you need the right curvature estimates, so, so that's true, so that you get this, well, already to get the, the topology is the same, is, is already something that needs, needs a, a, attention somehow. Okay. <clears throat> so this has to, this strategy has to be corrected in the general case. And le let me draw a picture of why this can't quite work as it's given. The problem is there are Ricci limit spaces that definitely can't be flowed at all. In fact, you can take a Ricci limit space that's a smooth manifold. So a smooth manifold with a lower Ricci bound is certainly a Ricci limit space, just approximated by itself. Okay. So if we were going to carry this strategy out and flow the Ricci limit space, then we better be able to flow smooth manifolds. <coughs> the problem is that you can't in general, at least with very high certainty, but nobody knows how to prove it. I'm going to draw you a picture of a uh, a three-dimensional manifold that, you, that satisfies all the right conditions that you won't be able to flow. So take a cross-section here with an S2, but let it shrink down to, to nothing. And you can do that maintaining a lower Ricci bound, e even as you go far, 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 far out. So what will Ricci flow try and do? Well, Ricci flow, if you have a S2 cross R, will just be shrinking it as a, a shrinking cylinder. Okay. Far out here, it looks pretty much like an S2 cross R, but you have a very small S2. So if I go out here, then it takes a very short time to pinch. But if I go even further, then it takes even shorter time to pinch. So of course, if you tell me that you found a, a solution starting at this that lives for a certain time, then I just go far enough out that it would pinch before then, and that can't be right. Okay, so we're going to have to do something a little bit, uh, something a little bit different. <coughs> So what's the resolution? So let me, uh, let me state a theorem which gives you a sort of modern version of the resolution. It wasn't the sort of initial resolution. We'll see what that is in a second. And this resolution is using something we call pyramid Ricci flows. <coughs> So, what does non-collapse mean? It can mean two different things. 
it can mean that for every point, the unit bore has a volume that's bounded below. Or it can mean that there's one point where the unit volume is bounded below. Okay, So clearly the st stronger condition is not satisfied over here, which is what you're worrying about. But I can just take any point here. Just take any, in fact, any point here. If I keep taking that point, then obviously the volume of the unit bore, if I'm taking the same manifold over again, is not going to zero. So there's a huge difference between those conditions. If you assume that every unit ball has volume bounded below, then reach flow is much easier. So <clears throat> all these difficulties, you, know, you sort of put your finger on, on the distinction here. Uh, all, all, all the difficulties only arise where um, you have this sort of weak, what we call weak non-collapsing. That's not a standard term, but that's what we call it. Okay, so this is uh, a theorem from uh, 2018 with Andrew McLeod, and um, a lot of the ingredients <coughs> are, that we need are in this work with Miles Simon. And the actual picture of what we're doing um, is related to the work of uh, Raphael, as I'll explain a little bit later once we have it, know enough to be able to explain it. So let, let's try to um, <coughs> give you a sort of stripped down non-technical version. So let's say given, uh, let's add it in the, this, we're always assuming non-collapse, but uh, giving a non-collapsed three-dimensional Ricci limit space. Let's call it XD. Then there exists a smooth manifold M and a sequence of times TK going to zero a point in the manifold, let's call it x0, and a distance metric on m, and let me just say in words, that has the same, generates the same topology as m already has, <laughs> and a Ricci flow, but not a normal Ricci flow, so-called pyramid Ricci flow. G of T. So what is that? This is a Ricci flow which is not defined on M or, or, or yeah, so it's not defined on M cross time. It's not defined on a parabolic cylinder. Okay? It's gonna be defined on a subset of space-time. Okay? So that aspect of being defined on a subset of space-time was first considered by Raphael. But we do it in a different way, a different subset, so you can get different sort of estimates. So let me explain where we define our G of T. So this is defined on a set, let's call it D for domain, and it's going to be a union of regions in space-time. I'm going to take a ball. <coughs> measured with respect to d0 of radius k and I'm going to cross it with the time interval <coughs> 0 up to tk. Closed or open as you like. Okay, so maybe I can squeeze a picture in here. I'll probably be drawing this picture a few times. So if this is the manifold m, then if you take the sort of unit, so this is x0, if you take the sort of unit ball, then it's defined for sure this G of T on this parabolic cylinder going all the way up to T1. But if you take the ball of radius 2, then it's, it's also living here. And then this keeps on, this region sort of keeps on extending 
all the way out to infinity. So this is a sort of pyramid. So it's the Ricci flow is actually defined on the whole, the whole region here. Okay. So what can we do with that? So what we have is that if you look at the distance metric of G of T, then this converges to D0. <coughs> so the nice thing about this version with Andrew is that the distance convergence is clean to state. So this will converge locally uniformly as T descends to zero. So M comma D zero is an initial condition for this Ricci flow in the sense that we've discussed. And we have that M D zero is equal to, so isometric to, the Ricci limit space we call it X comma D. So the flow starts with the Ricci limit space. Okay. Um, and moreover, squeeze it in here, you have a bi Hilda condition. So for any omega compactly contained in M, then the identity restricted to omega from M comma D zero to M comma G T, as long as you take T small enough, so this actually uh, is well, is actually defined, then this will be uh, by Hilda. Okay. So this so clearly solves this uh, conjecture um, and the stronger version because you started off with the Ricci limit space. You've used Ricci flows to regularize, okay, You're using it as a mollifier and the, uh, the homeomorphism is simply the identity. <coughs> Um, so that's the question that would have been difficult to answer if I'd given the original version. But the, because the domain here is increasing to everything, if you take any compact region, I mean, you can choose how you want to do it. You know, if you take a, a ball of a certain radius, once it's bigger than the ball of two or three times that radius, then you don't have to worry about convexity or anything. In the, in the, in the original case, it was quite uh, annoying to write. You're always worrying about the sort of thing you're worrying about. <coughs> okay. Um, okay, so not only does it solve this, but it also you can see how you're escaping the problem over here. So the problem over here is that you could have singularities developing pinching at infinity. But here you're just saying, well, I'm going to stop the Ricci flow being defined before they pinch. So there's this sort of chain of sort of pinching necks here, if you like, coming out that never actually is in the domain of definition of the, of the flow itself. <coughs> okay, so um, let me try and explain a little bit about the, uh, the, the proof. So to understand the proof, we need um, to understand a notion of local Ricci flow. So this preceded the, the pyramid Ricci flow story. So local Ricci flow has, um, in one guise or another, a long history. So I guess Dean Yang was an early person to consider that in one context. Um, the whole topic of Ricci flow with boundary has been studied at length. And there are a lot of authors that have worked on that. Um, let me not try and survey that. Uh, none of these techniques will... Uh, so so the, the, the theory of Dean Yang is actually uh, very applicable, but not in the situation that we're working. 
And the Ricci flow of boundary theory is quite fraught from a PD. Trying to get the PD to mesh with the geometry is, is unusually hard uh, in this situation. Then there's um, a theory which I started introducing in, in two dimensions a long time ago. Um, so, I don't know, the first talks on that were around 2005 with the idea that I'm going to mention in, in a second. Um, <clears throat> then there's the theory uh, uh, using the same sort of principle of Raphael and the theory we need is in the work with uh, Miles Simon. So let me, so what is a local Ricci flow? A local Ricci flow is instead, so given a, a manifold, which needn't even be a complete manifold, but let's for simplicity say that it is. So given uh, sort of mg0 and a point in m and uh, a radius, which the reason that you'll see in a second I'll just take to be a, an integer. So let's say for simplicity complete. So the local Ricci flow idea is to flow simply on starting with this initial data, but restricted to the ball of radius, you know, finite radius. So you're taking, <coughs> you're taking a, uh, you know, imagine the plane and then restricting it to a ball. So now you're starting the Ricci flow with a ball. There are various ways of doing that. In this situation, you're flowing as an incomplete flow. All right, so um, an obvious flow in that situation would just be to take this, the static solution. But generally, generally that's, that's not possible. So the theory says um, in various situations you can flow on this ball of radius k for a time which is going to depend on k. Maybe I'll write k and on the, and on the metric in, the, in this particular situation. <coughs> um, and depending on the theory you're looking at, uh, the important thing is that you get estimates. So a philosophical point here is that normally in PDE theory what you're doing is you're trying to find conditions that are weak enough to get existence and strong enough to get uniqueness, the sort of standard natural gain. In this situation you change the philosophy. So you're trying to get existence but you weaken the condition of uniqueness and all you're asking is that you're in a class of solutions that satisfy enough estimates so you have the right sort of notion of compactness. <coughs> and that sort of simple step just solves so many problems. Uh, in particular if you compare with the Ricci flow with boundary theory which is sort of natural thing to do from a PDE point of view, try and specify Dirichlet boundary data, you're just stuck forever. So you really need to switch philosophy, it's a new philosophy of, uh, you know, it's a sort of trivial step but makes all the difference. Just weaken, don't worry about uniqueness, just worry about estimates. <coughs> so what's the sort of method that you would use to flow locally in the absence of sort of this sort of PDE philosophy of getting uniqueness? So this is from the 2D theory I developed. Let me, uh, let's imagine you're trying to flow on a ball of radius k sort of chopping everything out. So what you do is actually you start off looking at the ball of radius one more, for instance, k plus one. And then what you do is you can formally blow up the metric on the annulus outside here so that it becomes complete and hyperbolic at infinity. And somehow the significance of it becoming hyperbolic is that the curvature is bounded but it's still complete. Okay? Once you're in that game, you can just flow using very standard theory forward in time and then restrict back to the smaller region. So kind of simple strategy, but uh, in the 2D theory it's quite easy to carry out and then you have to worry a little bit more about uh, getting the blowing up 
conformally, for instance, in the high dimensional case uh, that's in uh, Raphael's work. Um, but anyway, it, it all works out and uh, um, everything is nice. So let's imagine we want to try and uh, apply this theory. Well, uh, need to weight train the lecture here. So let's imagine we want to apply this theory to prove that we have these pyramid Ricci flows. So what you can do, imagine naively doing is to start off with your manifold M and then apply the local Ricci flow theory for k equals 1. And then you get a Ricci flow on the parabolic cylinder there. Well then you can just apply it separately again on the board of radius 2. And then you get your Ricci flow here and then do it here. So you could just keep doing it. But of course now we've given up the uniqueness something bad is happening. There's no reason why the Ricci flow, this Ricci flow here, should agree with this Ricci flow here. Right? So you're just getting a whole bunch of Ricci flows. You can't take the union. It just won't give you, it won't give you anything at all. So the, um, the key step is to prove a different result. So this is in the paper with with Andrew, it's called the pyramid extension lemma. And, and here you'll see the, let me erase this picture so I've got more space. And here you'll see what's, uh, what's going on. There are various extension lemmas in this game and somehow that's often where the content the content is. So for this, so this is with uh, Andrew. So set up, we have a manifold with a uh, lower Ricci bound. So let's say it's complete. And uh, some control on the, the volume. So the theorem says there exists a bunch of sequences, let's say one of them CK, that's going to uh, infinity, typically. Then there's another one alpha K going to infinity. There's another one TK that's going to zero. That's sort of going to be related to this TK that we've already seen. And these are only depending, all of them, only really important on alpha zero and v0. I mean each one obviously depends on the k, but the sequences do just depend on that. Such that two things are true. Sorry, Andrew gets much the dust. So the first one is that whichever k you take, whichever radius you take if you like, then there exists a Ricci flow g of t on the ball a radius k <coughs> living up until time tk with the right initial data where it's defined obviously the left hand side's only defined on this on this ball and nice estimates so those estimates are that the Ricci bound persists or some other Ricci bound persists um, but that Ricci bound is going to depend on 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 the K and also you gain control on the full curvature tensor even though you had no control on that initially whatsoever so you get uh, a bound C K on T. Okay, that is local existence, right? Those are the estimates that you get. So that's a local Ricci flow theorem, but there's more. So there's a second condition which uses the same constants. So certainly the constants that you get from the local Ricci flow theorem will not work in this in this theorem here. The next 
thing. So as if you, we already have a Ricci flow, let's call it G tilde of T, on a bigger ball. So let's say a ball of radius K plus one. And let's say that's living for time zero to T K plus one. And let's say it has the right initial data. <coughs> and has the right dk. So that would be ck plus 1 on t. Then, <coughs> run out of board annoyingly. Let's write it here. Then the Ricci flow from in part one can be chosen to agree with G tilde where they overlap. So where do they overlap? So you've got a, uh, a ball of radius k here, you're going up to tk, then you've got another one of tk plus one. So the first result said you, you have a Ricci flow on this region here, and the next thing said, well, if you already had a Ricci flow on here, then this Ricci flow here can be taken to agree with that, okay? So by doing that, so it's only agreeing, of course, on this hash theory here. <laughs> Check a more accurate clock. Okay. So there's something very different about this result to, to the uh, local Ricci flow result because the TK that's appearing here is coupled with the TK. It is this TK plus one is the TK of K plus one, if you see what I mean. So that requires um, a lot of care in choosing <laughs> your constants. Uh, that can be a, that can be a little bit confusing. The rough strategy of how you do this, very very roughly, is you know if you have this sort of Ricci flow, this initial Ricci flow here, you work hard to get estimates sort of moving in a little bit, um, so that after a certain amount of time, you have enough lower Ricci control that you can actually restart the flow with another local existence theorem from here or upwards. I mean that is a little bit vague. But uh, instead of getting bogged down in the details of the proof, let's let's just f finish off by seeing how this actually proves the um, how this actually proves the uh, pyramid Ricci flow result on the board at the top. So let's say you give me some smooth manifold and some huge k. So I can apply this pyramid extension lemma, part one of it, to get a Ricci flow on this huge, let's say, capital K for a, a short time t sub capital K. Okay? And then I can just apply the pyramid extension lemma again, but now part two, but for k minus one. So you just extend it on a, a radius k minus one, and then apply it again, part two, and then part two, part two, part two. And you'll just build up on a smooth manifold, you know, you'll start at some radius capital K, you'll have your initial Ricci flow and then you'll keep building up, building up, building up, and eventually you'll get to, uh, you'll get to one. Okay, so that, that gives you, starting with a smooth manifold, it'll give you a finite pyramid Ricci flow defined on it. Now what's absolutely crucial here is that the shape, this is, and this diverges from earlier work, for instance Raphael's work, the shape of this space, this subset of space-time, is independent of everything apart from the alpha zero and v zero, the basic geometric information. So what you're going to do to prove this pyramid 
Ricci flow theorem is you take all the take the sequence of approximating manifolds that defines this Ricci limit space. So it is the limit of a sequence of manifolds. So for the ith one of those, start i out and build up a pyramid Ricci flow. Then you take the next i, so you're starting one further out, building up a pyramid Ricci flow. But as you start further and further out, the shape on any compact region is the same. So that allows you to prove a compactness result, which will allow you to pass the limit of these sort of finite pyramid Ricci flows. And in the limit, you get, uh, you get the sort of limiting Ricci flow. So just, going, just finishing off by uh, going back to the beginning of the talk, of course, one thing that's absolutely crucial here is that this limit Ricci flow um, achieves its initial data. And we saw it right at the beginning that that really can be a problem. So one of the key things um, is proving that the flows you get have these lower Ricci bounds. So this is uh, a technology that I introduced with Miles, um, so-called double bootstrap technique um, that's been around. We actually worked it out in um, the Oberwolfach PD meeting, one of yours, uh, maybe five years ago or something, um, almost six years ago. And that's sort of the engine that makes you not have to worry about that example that I wrote at the beginning. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs>